Our first morning of married life in our new flat was disturbed by a phone ringing in the communal hallway. After ignoring it for a while, we weren't in from our travels until 2am, I went to answer it. It was my mum checking that we had got home safely. I was naive enough to think that as a married woman, girl, my mum would stop worrying about me. Now, as a mother and a grandmother, I realise that the worry never stops. Anyhow, on wakening, we were too tired to wonder how the bed got made up. We realised that various bits of furniture had materialised. The wedding gifts had been unpacked and put away, and the place looked quite homely. An envelope sitting beside the bed contained a cheque for £100, a gift from Gordon's mum and dad. The telegrams, olden day texts, were also there. Ironically, there was one from the parish priest who had caused me such unhappiness, wishing me all the best for the future. I wonder how he would have reacted to the fact that we are still together 48 years later. We headed for the city centre to buy furniture and for our £100 we were able to buy a wardrobe, a dressing table, four air-cold dining chairs and a small cottage suite. We couldn't wait for it all to be delivered. In a week we had become an old married couple. We settled down to married life, the two of us and the mice. We weren't aware of them until one night while watching the telly, a black and white set from Radio Rentals, I noticed something moving in the corner of the living room. The scream I let out could only be heard by dogs in the immediate vicinity. Suffice to say there was a large family of them and for the next few months I was reluctant to return to the flat on my own. Meanwhile, on the political front, the SDLP had come into existence. The British Army, which had been welcomed by the Catholic community, was now seen as the enemy and soldiers were being killed. Charlie Hockey was found guilty of importing weapons destined for Northern Nationalists. Rioting on the streets was common practice in 1970. I wouldn't like to guess how many buses and cars were burned. Parts of Belfast began to resemble a war zone. Nightlife practically came to a halt. It was noticeable that the number of large groups from across the water were avoiding Belfast. So TV became the main source of entertainment. We had Morecambe and Wise, Scylla Black and Val Dunigan keeping us entertained. Over the coming months there were nights of continuing riots and we fell asleep to the sound of petrol bombs and occasional gunfire. As it was becoming difficult to be sure of crossing the city in the morning to get to our workplace, the hubby was on the Stony Road and I was in Dundonald House, we decided we needed a car. We headed to see the bank manager and were able to borrow the princely sum of £325 to get our new wheels. Not having a clue about cars, I left it up to the hubby. He came home with a Mini Cooper of indeterminate age and condition from Mervyn Stewart's who were, I believe, in Great Victoria Street at the time. Like many businesses in the 70s, a bomb later destroyed the showroom. We were over the moon with our new car. We were so excited that we offered to bring my mum and my mum-in-law to see a play in Portadown. One of my work colleagues was appearing in it. We duly arrived to pick them up and started off to Portadown. Now they say that pride comes before a fall and we were extremely proud of our new purchase. With about 10 miles to go to our destination, there was a thud, followed by a scraping noise. Gordon stopped the car, got out, and was gutted to find the exhaust pipe lying in the middle of the road. Oh, the embarrassment. We arrived somewhat late for the production, after a patch-up job on the exhaust. We settled into a routine, and Saturday was shopping day. A local grocery store was the venue and the bill for my weekly shop rarely exceeded £6. No luxuries and no carry-outs. Basic food and very few occasions to eat out. We had no washing machine, so a couple of nights a week were spent in the laundrette in Botanic Avenue. No central heating, no microwave. How did we manage? To save money, we travelled home to the parents at the weekend, got well fed and waited on. We had the car for a couple of months and after the necessary repairs it was going great. In fact it was quite a mover. We were able to park right outside our bedroom window. The bedroom being at the front of the flat and the flat being on the ground floor. Okay, I know you all realise that. Anyhow, one morning we headed off to work. I went out first. 
Gordon, I shouted, where did you park the car? There was a space where our car should have been. Cars were parked on either side of the space. Our car was gone. We phoned the police and were stunned when Gordon was asked where he had been at two o'clock the previous night. Apparently our car had been used as a getaway car for an armed robbery on the Antrim Road. When it was eventually returned, we discovered a jemmy stuffed down behind the passenger seat. Obviously a thorough search by the RUC. When I look back on it now, we were both very young to get married, but it wasn't unusual. Back in those days when women were still treated as second-class citizens, for young women to see their future as married with a family. I even had to resign from the civil service in getting married and had to reapply for my job. I think we were lucky in that we both lived independently from our families for a number of years and were used to budgeting and looking after ourselves. It must have been difficult getting married, leaving home and straight into managing a household. As we headed into 1971, we had hoped that things would improve and peace would return to Northern Ireland. How wrong we were. If you enjoyed this video, please remember to like it, post a comment and share it with your friends. You can also subscribe for free to my YouTube channel to be informed of future episodes. Thank you.